Thank you very much, Quinn. Can everyone hear me? Yes, very loud and clear. Perfect. Um, thank you to APHR for giving us the opportunity to be in conversation with its member parliamentarians. And it is really a great honor to be with all of you today. Um, I'm going to go right into it. And um, I think Joe has also laid out some of the things that um, I had intended to explain um, in my presentation. And thank you, Joe, for starting the conversation. But I'm going to get right into it and perhaps um, respond to the first question, which is, when can we say that emergency laws aimed at tackling COVID-19 have become threats to human rights and democracy? Um, I re I, I'm not sure if you've seen the original question in the um, program agenda that was distributed by Quinn, but um, if you can see that I actually tweaked it a bit. So it now says really, when can we say that emergency laws aimed at tackling COVID-19 have become threats to human rights and democracy? Um, the reason for my tweaking it a bit is that emergency laws per se are not per se, are not threats to human rights and democracy. Um, we have to emphasize that um, human rights is very pragmatic. It is actually, um, um, it responds to situations and gives and recognizes situations like these. So there is leeway under international law, international human rights law, for public emergencies to be called and established. And we see all over the world that governments are struggling to respond to this very unprecedented public health crisis. And some governments have responded by limiting some rights, as many of the governments in Southeast Asia have done. So under international human rights law, um, some rights may be limited during times of emergency. But we have to remember that these limitations must be done within certain parameters. And um, I, I would like to refer you to the Syracuse principles, which I understand um, our colleagues at APHR had distributed to you before the start of this webinar. Has, does everyone have it? Um, does everyone, um, is everyone able to access it right now, the Syracuse principles? Yes, yes. Yeah, I can see Arlene doing that. So I'm assuming that everyone and Wong Chen. So um, that is one of the areas where I'm saying that human rights is pragmatic and human rights does recognize situations like these. And um, looking at the Syracuse principles, we may also be able to answer our second question, which is, under international standards, what are the safeguards that should be in place? So if you look at the Syracuse principles, there are indeed some rights that may be derogated, derogated when a public emergency is declared. Um, but first, we have to consider, when can a public emergency be declared? Um, Joe, I believe, has touched on some aspects of this. But what must we remember? when a public what can we when can we say that a public emergency may be declared first um, when there is a situation of exceptional and actual or imminent danger which threatens the life of the nation and in many cases and in many areas of the world in many contexts we may say that this crisis does indeed threaten the life of the nation um, also there should be a public and official proclamation that must be made. And prior to calling the, pub, the state of, emer of emergency, there must be procedures under national law for how this proclamation may be made. And in many countries in Southeast Asia, this is usually found in the constitution. And upon the declaration of a public emergency or a state of emergency, um, the state must notify the other parties to the ICCPR, to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, of the provisions that will be de derogated. I'm sorry, I think you may hear my children. That is how 
for women like us live nowadays. So I'm really sorry. Um, we are homeschooling our children right now. Um, so, um, so, um, so in notifying the UN, the Secretary General, um, you have the state has to sp stipulate which provisions will be derogated and what are the reasons for the derogation. And um, this would necessitate actually including the factual circumstances leading up to the proclamation of the state of emergency. Very important also is the duration. When will it start and when will it end? So um, under international law, the duration must be pegged at the shortest time required to bring an end to the public emergency, which threatens the life of the nation. So the duration has to be clear. When, when does it start? A very clear date. And when, when will it end? A very clear date as well. And the duration should be at the shortest possible time required to respond effectively to the public emergency. Um, the next point is very important to parliamentarians like you, and this is constant assessment of the situation. Um, if you look at um, paragraph 55 of the Syracuse principles, it does really specify that there should be prompt and periodic independent review by the legislature of the necessity for the derogation measures. So this is where the very important role of parliamentarians come in. Um, another important point that must be present when there is a declaration of a public emergency is that effective remedies should still be present, which means that courts should not be closed. Courts should still be open. Um, the, these remedies should be available for persons who are claiming that their rights are being abused, especially when these are violated, especially when it comes to non-derogable rights, or that the derogation measures affecting them are not strictly required by the exigencies of the situation. So again, courts must still be in operation. And I do realize that courts all over Southeast Asia and all over the world are struggling on how to keep open because they do still have to consider the safety and the health of their judges and their staff. And um, I'd like to refer everyone to the guidance that's being, that has been formulated by the International Commission of Jurists. It is an, on our website on how courts may still operate during the time of COVID-19. If um, I can also send Quinn and our colleagues in APHR the link to this um, particular document, which you may want to look at. And um, as parliamentarians, um, I realize and I understand that there are um, groups of parliamentarians, committees that are assigned to liaise with the courts. And this is where the important role of these groups or committees would kick in. They have to work together with courts on establishing measures, establishing procedures on how they can still keep going and offer effective remedies for those persons who are claiming that their rights are being abused or who are, who are challenging the imposition of these derogations. So as I said, derogations are allowed for certain rights only, not all rights. We have to remember that there are non-derogable rights. So these are the rights that no limitation may be imposed, even during public emergencies. So these non-derogable rights are the right to life, freedom of torture or ill treatment, arbitrary deprivation of liberty, and fair trial. And there are also a number of rights. But these are examples. Freedom of movement, they, um, it is a right that may be limited. Freedom of expression, this is also a right that may be limited. But then, when limiting rights, what should we be cognizant of? And Joe has um, laid out certain parameters, which is also included in the Syracuse pr principles. But I'd like to repeat and emphasize some of them. Um, 
So when limiting certain rights, these limitations should not be interpreted so as to defeat the essence of the right, right involved. So for, and this should also not be interpreted, and this should also be interpreted strictly in favor of the right always. So we can think about these two parameters in terms of what Joseph had mentioned early, earlier regarding the parameters or regarding the limitations on the right to freedom of speech and expression. Um, in interpreting these limitations, it must also be done in light of the context of the particular right concerned. And these limitations must also be provided by, by law. More often than not, this should be included in the emergency decree and should still be compatible under international human rights law, specifically the ICCPR. Very important, the, these limitations should not be applied in an arbitrary manner and again should still be subject to the possibility of challenge. So again, individuals, private individuals, or even you as parliamentarians may still go to, should still be able to the, go to the court to challenge these limitations. And um, these limitations must be necessary based on the grounds recognized under the ICCPR, um, which would be um, public health, national, national security, public safety, etc. And it also responds to oppressing social, public or social need, pursuing a legitimate aim, and should also be proportionate. There are some key points that I must emphasize um, towards the end of this um, presentation. First, again, Parliament should play an active role in providing oversight. There should be constant discussion among parliamentarians with, state, with other state authorities on the necessity of the um, state of emergency and also the necessity of continuing the limitations on certain rights. Limitations or derogations must also be limited in duration, strictly necessary, and proportionate to the specific threat. Um, also, in times of public emergency or state of emergency, um, <clears throat> it must be clearly stated who are the public officials who have the responsibility for implementing the provisions in the emergency laws and what are their powers and responsibilities. These public officials should not have immunity for any criminal acts they commit when they exercise their responsibilities. And um, decisions and actions of these public officials should, be, should still be subject to review by the courts. Also, it's very important to include a gender perspective when thinking about the, the application of these limitations, noting that certain limitations may have a different impact on women and people who belong to sexual orientation and gender identity minorities. Um, before I end, I'd like to build on what Joe said regarding um, freedom of expression and um, speech um, during this time of um, COVID-19. I think this is where um, we have the specific role and we have as human rights defenders and human rights advocates have the unique ability to foster counter speech and social dialogue. These are very unprecedented times. Um, there is no clear chart or path on how to emerge positively from this. So all of us all over the world are struggling to find a way to preserve rights um, while also curbing the spread of COVID-19. So what's very important during this time is during this time, especially when there is rampant disinformation um, and this disinformation often fans hate and intolerance, what's very important is actually counter speech and social dialogue. Facilitating greater dialogue is very important. And instead of imposing restrictions, we may want to consider fostering a culture of public discourse where everyone can freely and without fear of reprisal or retaliation talk about and debate experiences. 
we should also consider women's experiences challenging certain restrictions. We have seen many reports from all over the world, including parts of Southeast Asia, where many of the women face harassment and violence from state and non-state actors for raising concerns about limitations and restrictions being imposed during these times of COVID-19. And finally, again, I'd like to emphasize how legislators having a particular standing in society should proactively protect those who speak and seek to debate on matters of importance to society. There should be no culture of fear or a sense of a sword hanging over one's head when one speaks about an important issue. That's all. Thank you very much.